Hi, my name is Anthony Tran, and this is my art critic video assignment for a class uh, 305-2199 uh, with Professor Eve Wood. Alrighty, let's begin. The first artist I will be going over will be Faith Ringold. Faith Ringold was born in New York City on October 8, 1930. She lived in the neighborhood of Harlem with her father, Andrew Lewis Jones, who had a variety of jobs, including being a minister and a powerful storyteller along with her mother, Willie Posey Jones, who was a fashion designer. At a young age, due to asthma, Ringold was unable to attend school regularly and was instead encouraged towards artistic pursuits by her mother. Ringold enrolled in New York City's college in 1950, but couldn't major in art because it was exclusively a male profession at the time, and so she had to settle for art education. Ringold married Robert Earl Wallace in the same year, and quickly divorced due to Wallace's drug addiction, and they had two daughters, Michelle and Barbara Wallace. In 1955, Ringold graduated with a bachelor's degree in fine art and education. Ringold has stated she had an amazing education in art, but not African or African American art. After, their, after that realization, she found her artistic identity. As she states, I found my artistic identity and my personal vision in the 60s by looking at African masks and my art form through the serial paintings Migration of the Negro series of Jacob Lawrence, the powerful geometry of African masks and sculpture that informed modern art is what I like best about Picasso, Matisse, and the other modern European masters I was taught to copy. It is their exquisite composition of shape, form, color, and texture that make Picasso, Matisse, and Jacob Lawrence's work so wonderful. In the early 1960s, Ringgold produced the American People series. Due to gallery owner Ruth White refusing to use her previous paintings, as she believed Ringgold's paintings weren't to her standards of a life-changing piece. Ringgold is currently an activist for feminism and anti-racism cause and still continues her artistic practices to this day. Moving on to the artwork of hers I'll be analyzing, American People series number 20, Die, was made in 1967 and possibly inspired by Jacob Lawrence's Migration of the Negro series was acquired from the MoMA website. As I was trying to find a piece that would pique my interest and catch my eye, this piece did just that. To start off, the piece is clearly about the impacts inequality in America has had, not just for the African Americans, but on white Americans as well. Considering the time it was made, it's indicative of the polarizing tensions between African Americans and white Americans. It showcases the resulting horrors of prejudice and its effects on white Americans as well. Although white Americans did not have as bad of a time, it still shows that African Americans can step up against prejudice to defend themselves and their families if any sort of violence ensues from hate. And it can definitely promote a white prejudice in African American communities considering white Americans were, were incredibly oppressive towards Africans for many centuries and still face moderate discrimination in today's world right now. This is implied from the death of both a white American and African American man in the piece, and the crying African American girl hugging a white American boy in the middle of the ensuing fighting between adults is indicative of how the future is damaged as a result of such discriminatory hate stemming from the past. In other words, the present people's inability to put aside their differences and work together for the betterment of their future, their inability to do just that will cost them their future. Moving on, the very unrefined style of the piece took me back initially. It feels chaotic and provokes a sort of fear and sadness inside me as I continued to look at it. There are are some instances of normal lighting to this piece that simply add depth to the character's bodies for actions, in particular the white woman and black woman. 
but I noticed that there was also the use of the color blue as lighting to not just add depth, but for the blue lighting to contrast from the colors given to the character's skin and clothing, which I believe highlights a feeling of sadness amidst the ensuing chaos and fighting, which is emphasized by the crying children near the center. Along with large amounts of red blood spots splattered across the piece and is on essentially every character displayed in the piece. It's a statement of how no one is free from the struggle. Moving on, the lines in this piece are smooth, rarely rigid, and as a result, it does its best to mimic real life people while still defining itself as an artwork that isn't meant to be a portrait. The ways the eyes were drawn were in a sense uncanny to the seemingly smooth characters. It evidently promotes the feeling of sadness and fear within the characters. It just adds to the scary feel the already chaotic horde event taking place. And I believe it should also be noted that the style of the character's face may have been influenced by African art. Moving on, the next artist I will be talking about will be Henry Matisse. Matisse was born to middle class parents and lived with his father, Emile Matisse, and Anna Gerard. In 1889, he went to college at St. Quentin and then Paris to study law, but soon after moved back to St. Quentin because he found the job to be quite anxiety producing and tedious. At the time, he was 20 and welcomed the idea of painting. Funnily enough, Matisse decided to leave St. Quentin to go back to Paris to study art. Influenced by his teacher, Gustave Moreau, in 1892, his quote, Colors must be thought, dreamed, and imagined, contributed to Matisse's expressive use of color. In 1894, Matisse had a daughter, Marguerite, with his lover, Caroline Joblod. He was accepted into the École des Beaux, arts in 1895 and continued to study with Moreau until 1898. In 1898, he ended his relationship with Carolyn and married Amélie Perret. Moreau had suddenly died while Matisse was on a honeymoon with his newly wedded wife, and Matisse looked for another teacher. He would soon have two sons born from his wife, and despite the struggle of caring for three children, he had purchased avant-garde art. The Three Banthers, from Paul Cezanne. In 1905, Matisse met Pablo Picasso, and after that fateful meeting, a lifelong friendship and rivalry developed. As Picasso deconstructed art into Cubist planes, Matisse focused on constructing an arts form through color. In 1907, Matisse moved from the Falve style to a more simplified form style, with flat planes of color. And, at the same time, he had an increasing interest in sculpture, in particular in North African work. And soon after, was able to open his own art school and teach around 80 students for over three years. During 1911 to 1916, Matisse focused on the human figures surrounded by interior spaces, and as a result of World War I, he soon lost his inspiration, but found it again during 1917 to 1930 returning to his colorful artistic roots. During the year 1930, he was overcome by an artistic crisis and dissatisfied with his very conservative work, looked towards America to find inspiration. In 1931, he was commissioned to paint a mural by the Barnes Foundation in Pennsylvania, which he finished in two years. In 1939, which he separated from his wife. And with the additional stress of World War II and health ailments, it all just compounded and affected his work. In 1941, he was confined to a wheelchair after a surgery, where he soon turned to drawing and paper cutouts for his means of expression. With the help of assistance, Matisse kept working through his illness until his death on November 3, 1954, due to a heart attack. Moving forward, the piece by Henry Matisse that I will be analyzing will be the Legere, made in 1953, a piece Matisse made during the last years of his life. The Legere is quite beautiful, 
The colors speak for themselves. They're bright, easy in the eyes, and work well together. There are darker colors around the edges, but they're balanced out by pieces of bright colors overtaking them. This piece is meant to provide the viewer with a feeling of serenity, to look at the art and let their problems flow away from them, perhaps an escape from Matisse's own physical condition and health at the time may have been the inspiration for this piece. Regardless, the serenity is further emphasized by the very simple and childlike lines the shapes are drawn like. It's very pure in a sense as it's reminiscent of a child, yet it still has the smoothness to it that keeps the shapes conformed and satisfying to look at. In a way, it could entertain the idea of not being perfect and is content with that, as displayed with all the shapes being, yes, very similar, but not quite identical to one another. On to the topic of lighting. This piece does not really incorporate lighting, as it intends to stand as a simple artistic work that doesn't try to do too much, but rather just enough in the realm of color and line to put the viewer at peace. For me, this piece embodies serenity and acceptance, which may also be the result of Matisse's condition and state of life during his last years, where he may have come to terms of his state of being. For this piece's cultural significance, I believe it signifies coming to terms with one's imperfections. And as a result, it may promote serenity within oneself. Given the 20th century and even today's 21st century both emphasize the idea of perfection unto many people in society, as it leaves everyone stressed and miserable as they try to achieve it. Thank you for watching this video, and this is my cited works for the information on the artworks and the biography of the two artists.